understand like this amount. Yeah. Not sure. It doesn't have the top piece at the bottom piece. I did. It got shorter. I apologize. I'm exhausted. I'm not feeling so well. So you see where the light gets us. If I fall asleep, just leave me. Like, uh, put the pillow under my head somewhere. She got pull the hair, put the pillow on. Can we still count this Say that again? Can we still count this the minion? You can. Very good to see everyone. Um, it's. I wanted to start off. We'll, we'll we'll try and get into the sleepers. We'll try and get into sleepers today. Beit Hashem will get that. I had a conversation yesterday, which has been playing on my mind, and it's something for us to think about. I'm, I'm not looking for an answer yet, but just the just the interesting matisse of the issue that took place. People want to feel happy. People want to feel happy, they want happiness, they want fulfillment. I know that Uncle Freddie and I have spoken about this many times. I mean, you know, that it's like, there's a natural drive, we want to, there's a status quo, we want to have happiness and fulfillment. And, and I had two conversations yesterday, and the two conversations reminded me of a conversation I had with the Pilsner Rav, and it's just so profound. People are their own worst nightmares. No one has to hurt certain people because they are amazing at hurting themselves. Now remember the Pilsner Rav, the Pilsner Rav would say as follows, that everybody has within them the friends, the midot of skepticism, sarcasm, and cynicism. The three friends that are within us. We have cynicism, skepticism and sarcasm. And he said that relates to the three different spiritual planes of the other side, Olam, Shana, and Nefesh. Cynicism is coming from a very high place. Skepticism is from a more emotional place. And, and sarcasm is, is maisa. It's the way you react and relate to someone. And he said it relates as well to three other makudas, where really maybe it's the source. This whole question, what's the source of cynicism, skepticism and sarcasm. So you have assumptions, expectations, and you have assertions. And an assertion is when you physically, so to speak, intervene. You have an expectation, an assumption. Expectation is in your mind you assumed it, and then in the moment emotionally, um, you know, expectation, I assumed it would take place. I assumed that's what was going to happen. The Pilsner used to say that these midot, these midot are Midot sometimes can destroy a relationship. Why? Start with expectations, assumptions, and assertions. Yeah, expectations and what happens is a person believes something should work a certain way. You come and you're in a friendship and your friend acts a certain way which doesn't fit into your paradigm. You get upset. And for some people, they expect and expect and expect, and they get let down, let down, and let down. And it ruins their relationship. So what would happen if you take away that assumption? What happens if in every other area of the relationship, everything's okay, and in this particular area, turning up on time? They tell you, oh, I'm going to turn up on time, and they don't turn up on time. Perfect. They don't turn up on time, and they don't turn up on time. But every other area of the relationship is amazing. So what happens if, if you think about it, and this was actually the situation, the person got so bitter and so upset, so bitter and so upset, that the whole relationship has been destroyed. 
I said to them, let's play around. I know this person, so I could, I could push a little bit. I said, let's play around. Take away the assumption. Take away the assumption. You know they are not going to turn up on time. You know that. What would the relationship look like? Perfect. In every other area of the relationship, they are amazing. This area, they just suck in it. They can't get it. They can't turn up for the life of them. And it's amazing because what happens is by the time they can, somebody's going to speak to somebody else about something, usually there's a cloud, but already it was niggling at them for some time. Especially from like halakhic perspectives. You know, you have a couple that sits with you. And... They, come, they say to you, yeah, we've had this problem, and it's causing us much pain and much grief. Well, how long have you had the problem for? Oh, 15 years. Like, what the heck happened between the problem started and 15 years later? It's a funny thing. People, like, live with it, or they don't know that they can deal with it. They don't have anyone to speak to. Whatever it may be, but there's these expectations in our lives, and these expectations kill us if they're unhealthy expectations. So this person became so cynical, so cynical about this beloved relationship that they once had that they don't have now. And we end up speaking for a bunch of time and basically mm -hmm. what came out from the conversation is if they, you're doing good. For the, yek, for the yekka, for the yekka, you're being very conceivish. What happens is that by the end of the conversation, they could entertain the thought of letting go, knowing that they won't turn up. But we do this to ourselves. We cause ourselves so much pain. No one has to cause us pain because we, majority of the time, all the time, are our worst nightmare. No one has to hurt us. We have expectations. We have assumptions, and then we assert our control and our authority over the situation. And then from the assumptions and expectations and assertions, we become cynical and skeptical. And then in the way we assert ourselves, we become sarcastic. Oh, again? Yeah, right. I know. And we end up hurting ourselves. And... When we come to the Yom Tevim, I find with a lot of people, when we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the Sukkot, Shemiyat Seret, so many people hurt themselves. Why? Because of our immaturity, our immaturity about our relationship with the Bodh Ayla, with Hashem. It's, it's very sad. The second conversation I had was speaking about the Yom Tevim. And... It really was the same pattern as the first conversation. The assumptions and the expectations. This year is going to be a different year when we come to the Yom This year is going to be this and this year. And all the and then they turn up. Last year they had a miserable time. They went to, they, they traveled to Uman. And they were managed to build up the expectations. And, and it's going to be amazing. And they went there. And it was like, all hell broke loose for them. It wasn't, it wasn't a good year for them. And, and we have to be so careful. Definitely, one of the deeper aspects of tshuva that we've been speaking about, one of the deeper aspects of tshuva, and this is one of the fundamentals of the Derek of Pilsner, is emes. To be truthful. And where and what does emes look like? It's our relationship with what? The outside world our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with the outside world. And as we've expressed so many times, tell me, can anyone hurt you without your permission? No. Nobody can hurt you without your wishes. <coughs> Nobody can hurt you without your permission. <coughs> Nobody. Impossible. Nobody can hurt you without your wishes. And as we've spoken about to be a baldas, to come to a place of consciousness and this place of awareness, that we have our midas, our midas are in nefesh, the lower parts of self, lower self. And thus, Tachtai is having the ability to have a relationship with our thoughts, with our feelings, 
with our, with our physical sensations. We are not them. They are part of us. And this experience, this transformational experience of tshuva, which it should be, is having the ability to place expectations in the right place after much thought. After much thought, we have to be in the moment with what's going on, and that's what relationship is. Even between spouses, even with husbands and wives, children, we expect. You know, it's a funny thing. My kid comes home, and it's. A, I, I find I do the same. My kids do the same. So what happens? They come home. I need a drink. And it's like you ask them, why are you so vicious when you ask for a drink? I need a drink because in their mind they've asked the question probably three, four times already. And what happens? I can come and I can expect a different relationship with the kid. Shouldn't speak like that. When you realize that a kid's a kid, they grow up, you can speak to them, they've come home, they're exhausted. And then I get annoyed based on an expectation or I assume. I assume he should speak differently. Or who, who created that assumption? Did I actually ever speak to him about it? How many times in our lives do we make assumptions on loved ones, on children, and we never actually told them that we have that assumption in the relationship? We just assumed they should act as a like common sense. Or common sense to who? In which arena of common sense? In which arena of culture? In which arena of friendships? And, and this is something when we go into the Chagim, especially with Rosh Hashanah. The experience of being a Baldas is you live in the moment. You break down. You break down everything that separates you from the here and from the now. In the world of assumptions and expectations, what happens is that we've painted a future that doesn't even exist. And as we said many times, we never even told the other person about the future. You have this future. I expect you to act like this. Well, did you ever tell me about that? Like, if my kid had a greater maturity, he'll turn around and say, listen, I've just come home from school. I'm a kid. And in my mind, I've, I've asked the question three times. Why did you expect? Did you ever tell me I should ask nicely? Yeah, we speak about it over here and over there. But when have kids had the ability to translate this behavior at a young age in any other area, forecasting, as we mature and our minds develop, yeah, we start to take patterns and replicate those patterns. In this, in this situation, I should be like this. But we, we, we assume that so many other people are in every area of their life full of this expanded maturity. Yes, sir. There are, but uh, for Rosh Hashanah, there are not only expectations that we ourselves make, there are expectations that come from the outside when we say there's a lot of pressure, or when we say this is the day when you are judged, or your whole parnasa for the next year will be determined on that day, and things like that. There's outside pressure and outside expectations. So this is where we're coming to. This is what we're going to come and hopefully deal with today. I think that uh, the, one of the big um, challenges that mankind has is what you just said, that we assume, that we make assumptions. And um, I'm sure it's happened to all of us, I know it's happened to me many times, where I've literally got myself sick or in a pain because I've gone through a whole scenario in my mind which never happened. I built it around myself and it's there. With that being said, I think we make assumptions about God. But God doesn't make assumptions about us. And this whole business about Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, I think a lot of people don't see the forest for the trees because they built assumptions that I have to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, it, it, it's um, almost if there are people who go through Rosh Hashanah and Kippur and feel they failed and then have self-fulfilling prophecies the rest of the year because they've been condemned. They've already seen God. And, and we know the truth is, God forgives us all. 
Period. And if Yom Kippur, we've got a brand new slate, like a new baby. So why are we so worried? I mean, it's a catch-22. We still got to go through the motions. And halacha lemaisa, we see that, especially with Rosh Hashanah. Halacha lemaisa, there's such... We spoke about this a little bit, I think, a few weeks ago, but we see the complexity, the halachic structure, the complexity, and, and the, the, the development of both sides. Is Rosh Hashanah a time of crying? And Bechi, or is Rosh Hashanah time of Simcha? Now, if we refer to Tanakh, for those people who learn Tanakh, it's what the Christians know really, really well, and we should learn more of it. The Tanakh, there's a book called Nechemia. And in Nechemia, Perek Ches, we learn out a very interesting halacha. The halacha tells us that we should dress nice, eat fatty meat, drink wine. And if you look at Nechemia, if you look at Rashi, Nehemiah is telling off the Yidden for crying so much. It's Rosh Hashanah. Go give Mishlach Manais to each other. Yet we have another side to Rosh Hashanah, which is a day of Din. So there's this paradox. I think, though, that we can come to express that just a beautiful grab. The going, the going says, there's a story with Rav Shlom as well. Rav Shlom Kalabach tells over an amazing story which relates to this grab. So if we get that. But the Gra says that the din is going to be made. And it's very much what Rev. Freddy was saying. The din is going to be made. There's going to be a din upon you. So the question is, how do you react towards that din? When we speak about all the Parnassah coming down, and when we speak about and people live the self-fulfilling prophecies, we've said before, there's a certain person... We've given, we gave over this year about the way we speak, the seeds that we plant. That's what grows from the seeds. If you plant an orange seed, you get an orange. If you plant an apple seed, you get an apple. If you plant a banana seed, you get a banana. If you plant an orange seed and you expect garlic, something's very wrong with you. If you expect apples and you plant... I don't know, watermelon, something's very wrong with you. So the way we speak, if we plant words of success, a success tree will grow. Yet, if we plant trees of fear and insecurity, that's what's going to grow. You can't speak out speakings of fears and insecurities and hope, and hope that a tree of emunah and betachai sprouts up. And Rabbi Yisrael Salam speaks about the power of speech, the power of dibble. And he expresses that the words that come out of our mouths and the dinyayness that we create, as we know we've, we've done in, in the Avaid of Harchavas Hadimyon. The Avaid of Har, Harchavas Hadimyon, recognizing that what separates us is up here. It's our midas. It's our thoughts. That's what separates us from truth. So we can still go into Rosh Hashanah with a knowledge, yeah, well, my Parnassim is going to be given over, developed, however it happens. Yet you can have in mind as well that I trust the Rabbi Nishalayla. I trust the Rabbi, I stand there. I stand there and I say, Rabbi Nishalayla, you're going to make a din. You're going to make a din. So I know that's going to happen. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to seriously, from a serious perspective, enjoy myself. I'm going to enjoy myself. I know a din is going to happen. So what I can do is spend time <clears throat> crying and crying, but we see on Yom Kippur, we see on, especially on Rosh Hashanah, it's not as man of tshuva, the way Yom Kippur is as man of tshuva. There's, there's a simcha, there's an exciting. It's exciting. There's something happening. So the question is, we... How do I relate to it? How do I react? How do I act? And there's this serious excitement. There's this, this serious happiness that goes on. I wear nice clothes. Halakha la maisa. I have a nice meal. Halakha la maisa. Well, I'm going to have a nice... Okay, I don't say halal. I have the Gemara. So don't say halal. Yet, the day is a day of simcha because all I can do is realize whatever's going to be is going to be. I have to do my hishtadlis. I have to do what I can do and create for myself a reality in front of me that resonates with the truth outside of me. 
that I can come to realize, you know what? My thoughts and feelings, my imaginations could be the end of me. I can create all these expectations. Oh, I did this sin. God's going to strike me down with a bolt of lightning. Well, you remember that there's a whole life, you remember we spoke about from the Rambam last week, that you've got a totality of your being, and in many other elements of your life, your mama should savvy. Shem is is going to judge you on this, and as we said, the first parak of the Rambam, it's ludicrous, it's ludicrous what people do. People go through some sort of trauma, and it's sad, it's sad, it's a reality, and it's sad. They go through once, they go through a trauma, and they make that trauma their whole life. It's, it's ludicrous if you think about it. It's crazy. An onlooker, they think it's mad. It's like, okay, it's happened. Let's move on. And they can't let go, and it's painful, and it's sad. And sometimes people, they, they kill themselves over it. It's sad because the, the imagination has grabbed them. These feelings have grabbed them of fear, and they can't let go and move on. And it's, it's painful and it's sad, especially if you work with people. And what's even sad, what's even more painful, is that you can have all the answers to give them to help heal them. Yet, until they make that choice to partake in the experience of healing, they won't heal. So sometimes, as we've spoken about, what does a good friend look like? If you know that they're not going to listen to you, sometimes just to stand back, and as they fall, you, you're with them to pick up the pieces. That's what a good friend does. So many times people come and they, you know, they ask me, oh, this person's going through so much pain, and I've told them and told them and told them and told them. And then they get pushed away. I've got the answer for you. No, it's not true. And they, they, the, the friend who's going through this torment and pain pushes everyone away. Because that's all they know what to do at that particular point in time. And when a person is, the average person is living a good, healthy life, we can be our own worst enemy. Tishrei is a loshan. Parakun tells us Tishrei is a loshan of beginning. It's also a loshan of letting go in Aramaic, letting go. And, and hopefully as we'll see, Slicha Mechil and Kapara, all the Lashonas of Slicha Mechil and Kapara is letting go. It's reorientating ourselves to come to a place of a truth measurement from in here to outside. Instead of, oh, Uncle Freddy looked at me in a bad way. Oh, he doesn't like me anymore. Oh, no, he doesn't like me. And then every time I see Uncle Freddy, I run the opposite direction. And then he sees me. And then one day he, confr he what's it, confr Confront. confronts. And he looks at me and he says, what the heck are you playing at? I'm so sorry I hurt you. You looked at me funny. And, and what? What the heck are you going on about? Mishigina. But you remember that I lent you this and I didn't give it back to you. And obviously you're really <coughs> upset about it. What? It didn't even cross my mind. Yet for six months I didn't speak to him. How many times does that happen? And it's <coughs> unbelievable that the shyness of Slicha, Mechila and Kapara are all the shyness of letting go as we'll see. Rafua, what's Reish Pehe? Rafua means to let go. It's letting go of the worst enemy of self sometimes. And it's healing, it's becoming friends with that worst enemy. It's telling that Mida, Alice Keith, everything's okay, everything's okay. And what happens? The minute you do that, you're liberated. The minute you know that your thoughts, your feelings, and your physical sensations are Midot, and they are part of you, but you can observe them. And we even see this in the Lushayness of Slichot. We see this, we see it. Says, it says in Slichot that Hashem, He, he owns the Nesham and He owns the Guru, which is the Mito. We are our awareness. So the reality is that there is this notion that plays out of coming to a place where I resonate with actually what's going on in the moment. So say somebody says something to you, you know that they have their own story as well. How many times have we told over the matzah about the guy coming home, we sat there having major shalom bias problem, and he was a good one, he gave a good, a good shout back to his wife when his wife shouted at him. 
And what happens? We spoke, we spoke about these ideas, we related to the ideas for a number of hours, and he's sitting at home with the children at the kitchen table, and, and you know, there's, they've just eaten, and she walks in, and she shouts at him, Again, you didn't tidy up the food? What the hell's going on here? I worked so hard. He wasn't working at the time. I worked so hard to bring her money, and after come home, you said you would tidy up. Usually, he would give a good one back, but he remained quiet. And she stormed off to her room. What happens? Ten minutes later, she comes out. And she looks at him. And she says, my God, I'm sorry. I've been in the bank. And as everybody knows, an Eris Israel, you go to the bank. You're there for nine and a half years. Just to sign 3,000 papers to put some money in the account. And the air conditioning in the bank was broken. And it was hot. So she comes home. What feelings she's feeling, what thoughts, she's hot, she's tired, she's annoyed, she's frustrated. And then, the food on the table, bang, she snaps. So really, did the lady arguing with her husband have anything to do with her husband? No. Inside her mind, there were all these residual feelings and thoughts and experiences and memories. Bang, she took it out on her husband. How many times do we get into arguments? Do we get frustrated? And it has nothing to do with the other person. Rarely does it have to do with the other person. How many times do we get frustrated with a company? And we ring up the company and you have this young man or lady at the other side, customer service, and they, you know, it could be the first days, they're in there, they're there, they're there to help you. And you scream at them. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And you, you know that my washing machine is broken. Okay, let me try to help you. And no, you're not listening to me. My washing machine is broken. It's been broken. I've dragged you 17 times. Oh, well, who have you spoken to? You didn't speak to me. It's the first time. And we smash up the person on the other side. It has nothing to do. It's to do with my frustration of the washing machine. And it happens to be that this human being on the other end is, is a punching bag. It's all to do with these midas that spur up and... Rosh Hashanah is a time of coming back to a point of pure emes, which we call das. Lakir es ha emes, lakir es ha emes of das, as, as uh, by Biala, one of the Biala Rebbe said. To know truth, you have to be about das. You have to have the state of awareness. Now, the way that occurs is by constant reminding, constant growth, constantly just growing, reminding, changing, developing. It's, it's having conversations with your friends about consciousness. You know, if we don't put in that effort of at least listening to each other and talking about these ideas and experiencing these experiences, they take a lot longer to become a reality and the sense of liberation <clears throat> and, and the sense of peace, the sense of quietness is further away than it could be. And when we come to Slichas, when we come to Slichas, Slichas, as we know by the Rambam, was a sequence of tefillas. The Rambam tells us in the Rosh Hashanah and the third parrot, that it was a sequence of tefillas that was said between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yet with our genius, we decided to put them in before Yom Kippur as well. And uh, before Rosh Hashanah, yeah? Before Rosh Hashanah, thank you. And, and we have... The Svadim, there's three different interpretations in Halakha of how Slichas are expressed. We, we have as an experience of Svadim, they have the Slichas, the whole of Elu, and we have a few days before, which is to do with the Korbanas, which is to do with Mosul Shabbos, many different secrets. Yet we have these Slichas, and for most people, I know for me, I'll talk about my experiences. When I come to Slichas, I actually asked my father, I said, Abba, I don't have a Slichas. This was a cut like a couple of years ago when I was in London, I was looking for slichas. I never owned the slichas. I said, I don't remember the slichas. I never had the slichas. And he says, yeah, you don't remember when you were 16, you basically said to hell with this, and, and you like gave it to me and walked off. I'm like, oh, did I? Yeah. I'm not into slichas. I wasn't into slichas. Now it's a little bit different. Hopefully I've matured a little bit. But what is slichas? Slichas for so many people, including myself, now it's changed. I mean, over the last couple of years, I've come to try and uh, forgive Slichus. So it's, it's a bunch of tefillas, a bunch of words that we rattle off. And for a lot of people, the technicality of the language, 
of the stylistic wording, it, it, the construct. Uh, uh, timing. Timing. Uh, yeah, timing in the mornings or in the evenings. People around you know, a lot of people don't necessarily find the experience. They say sleepers, they don't do slicha. And we're not going to go through all the slichas, but we will try to we'll try to pick up on something. And the goal is, as the Mishnah Guru says in the beginning, it's quality. It's quality. Find find something that resonates with something, and, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I wanted to start off with when we say slichot, we start off with Ashle Yoshre Vesecha Odia Lukasa. Then we go into Kaddish. And then from Kaddish, we have a couple of tefillot that we go through each day. Same tefillot that we go through each day. After that, then we have these different tefillot that are spoken out. By the Sfadim, the Sfadim, if people have not experienced the Sfadim Slichas, I'm telling you, it's what saved my life, the Slichas. I love Sfadim Slichas. You go, it definitely is early in the morning, but everyone sings together. It's absolutely beautiful. And some, some Ashkenazi Minyonim, some, they start, uh, some Ashkenazi Minyonim, they do a, uh, a sort of more musical, more joining in Ashkenazi sneakers together, which is well, it's very, very nice. It's very, very nice. This is a time of refocusing. This is a time of, you know, not, not panicking because we actually have to say sneakers and get up early and then feeling guilty because we got there late. It's a time where we should have a few minutes to have the Messiris Nefesh. It's to get up in the morning a that bit earlier, which is Messiris Nefesh. God, Hashem, I'm going to try my best. Listen, I remember the Kuna Halpen, I was telling him, I have no idea what's being said. I must have been about 15. I said to the Kuna Halpen, to Khan Lebracha in London, I said to him, I have no idea what's being said. He said that the Shin of the Rav, the Shin of the Rav was... Uh, one of his relations, Shinnabrav would say that you think that all these people who hardly could read understand what's going on? No. That the fact they turned up exhausted and early to shul shows that they care. And, and stage one, the fact that you get up or you stay up that little bit longer and you come to the base of Medrash, regardless of the content knowledge of the words of Allah, is so important to tap yourself on the back. It's so important, it's not to play. That's because you're a serious nefesh. Even if you're late. Even if you come usually late to Shacharis. And you come a few minutes earlier, five minutes earlier. That's worth the world. The fact that you got up shows that you care. And Rakuna said to me, listen, for you, Sheila, for you, you should know that if you don't understand the words and you can't even read the words... Get up early, sit at the back of the shul with a coffee, and if you know the tune, sing the tune. So he said to me, save me. Save me. To come a little bit earlier, sit, just to be with everyone, is so powerful. And to know that that level of consciousness exists, to get up that little, that's stage one, to turn up. Stage one is to turn up and to be present. And, and there's so many people, you know, I was speaking with somebody, he davens with us. He loves a long davening. He loves a long davening. We don't have, like, the long, long davening here. So he made his abayda. You know what? He spoke to one of his uh, rabbonim. And his rab said to him, I think for this person, for, for you, I think it's a more turn up. It's all your friends. It's all your chaveri. Turn up. Turn up is unrated today. To turn up is unrated. So many people don't even turn up because they weren't told that turning up is important. That's number one when we speak about slichas. Be here. Even if you're exhausted. The Sfarim tell us, Rabbi Nachman tells us, that the tiredness that one feels when they're missing every other word because they're like, oh, and you have your chamer waking you up for you giving me the shrachamim. That's worth everything. You're present. You're here. You turned up. Stage one. So before we go any further, know that that is important for the Rabbani Shalom to turn up. 
And even if you don't say anything, you can't say anything because you fell back asleep. You turned up. No one can take that away from you. And in any relationship, when you turn up, any relationship, even if you can't succeed what you wanted to succeed, hopefully the person has the proper healthy expectations and knows you. To turn up, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And by the ground, we said over a few weeks ago, by the Vilna Goyim, what, what did the Vilna Goyim look at within a Talmud? What did the Vilna Goyim look at within a Talmud? When the Vilna Goyim took a Talmud, he would sit with that Talmud, and he would go through a daf, and another daf, and another daf. Actually, go through the same daf of Gemara, with this Talmud, once, twice, three times, four, thirty times, thirty-five times, forty times. And the Talmudim that gave up, again we're going to do it? They could have been the biggest genius in the world. He wasn't so into it. The ones that sat and they worked, they turned up to the page each time again, even though it was the same time. They had, even though it was the same page, they had that patience. And they turned up. They may not have been the greatest chacham. That's who the grad took. To turn up, to be honest, to be real, to turn up. Would anyone like to share anything with their experiences of Tzlichus before we go into Ashri? Hopefully we'll, we'll try and express Ashri today. Does anyone have anything to share? Who likes Tzlichus? Does anyone like Tzlichus? I don't have much experience with Huh? I don't have much experience with Tzlichus. Yes, sir. I love, I love Yom Tov, the Yom Tov Kaddish, the tunes, the tunes, you know, the haunting tunes of the uh, Yom Tov, and by the Spadim as well, the tunes of the Spadim, the same tunes, ah, yeah, la 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 la, oh, unbelievable. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do, uh, it's because all the qualities that you have to have So, unlike my learned colleagues here, I've always hated sleepless. Um, not just getting up early on the morning, you know, morning for sleep, so I'm talking about... That's not such an issue for you getting up, is it? Now, that's not the problem. Yeah, I, I enjoy... It's very strange. I enjoy going to school. I enjoy to be low. Um, I enjoy most of the Rosh Hashanah davening. I enjoy most of the Yom Kippur davening. But when it comes to... I can't... I, it, it, it's like a nightmare for me. I don't want to deal with it. Okay, over and over, and about this thing, when you get to the, uh, uh, the Rabbi Khanon, the whole business there, the rabbi getting up there, it was just, uh, to this day, I'm not, you know, if, if it's up to me, I'll skip that whole part. I don't know, uh, it doesn't do anything, that's the point. I, I feel that if you have this kind of, you know, uh, great rub, Rabbi Woody Allen, he also said 70% of success just showing up which I totally agree with. But to do something you don't like, that defeats the purpose. So personally, I will show up and, you know, don't let this get out of here, but I will come to sleep close <coughs> many times and just sit there and day. <coughs> I don't even go through the motions. Because 
It gives me a bad feeling. So it gives me a fair bad feeling. Why should I do it? And that's why I'm also looking forward to the ECRM to maybe give me some idea of uh, you know what I'm missing that these guys. Have. So I think to somebody to say that you heard that? The seat, the sleepers, you know, say, say it a bit louder? A lot of times when the sleepers are going to be fluffy, yeah. You know what fluffy means? It's not real. Yeah, it's not real. Either you feel you're not guilty, yeah. or if you are guilty, you're going to do it again. You know, it's one or the other. There's not like, you know. It's because in a new place today. It's not just physical, but it's not just physical. So, there's definitely a mix of feelings, which is always brilliant, it's always wonderful. And we'll see, we'll see where we get to, we'll see what happens. We'll see where we get to, we'll see what happens. And the goal is to be real. And Shemis Baruch, as we said, if a person comes in, people, what's the famous Rob Chitzatur that we've spoken about, Tefillah? Give Rabbeinu Shalolam what you have to give him. If you come in exhausted, if you come in tired, don't turn around and say, ah, I don't have a head for davening. Turn around and say, Rabban Shalaylam, it's a likelihood that my davening will be two and a half seconds, I'm exhausted, I don't like you right now, and I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> Tell him! It could be Rabban Shalaylam, I'm mamish inspired, I'm going to give you, Beis Raz Hashem, a good, this is what I want to give you, this is what I have to give you, I'm excited right now, I'm giving you this. Give Rabban Shalaylam what you have to give, don't be too faced. And for a lot of people, it's very difficult. For a lot of people, you remember the Rabbi Shlomo, the Rabbi Shlomo, Rabbi Shlomo Karabach, he says, why do we do al Khait again on Yom Kippur? When we've done the al Khaits beforehand. He says, Mamusha, Pelitikatayra, it's unbelievable. Because when we did the Avera, we threw the Avera Shlomo. So we do the al Khaits and we bring Hashem, I did this chet, Hashem is borrowed, down in front of me. We... We have all these feelings, we run around, we run away, we try to hide. Real, MS, be real, be truthful, your life is happier for it. So many people live with toxic shame. Toxic shame. And they have no one to speak to about it. And as well as we've spoken about in the Shabbos HaGodel Drasha, toxic shame is multi-generational. You come out and you speak what needs to be spoken, however painful, you speak it with somebody who you trust, who you respect, it's like, okay, it's out, it's out in the open. It makes a big difference. Sometimes when you share, people often ask me the question, should you say sorry to a child? I've had this question before. Should you say sorry? When you've wronged a child, should you say sorry? Yeah, of course. So I, I find it's very, very important. How do the children learn what it looks like to say sorry? Of course. Be real. Be truthful. I remember that there was a certain Savik who was lived a couple of years ago. And he was a very, very simple person. lived in Tel Aviv. He was a Savik mister. And he walked around as a Rabbi Yossel, He walked around as a very, very simple, simple person. I remember I spoke him and somebody else, another tzaddik who, another tzaddik mister, who, one of his children, he said about his father, the tzaddik mister, he said about his father, you know, my father, one, I, I learned what it means to be truthful because he always apologized when he felt he wronged me. If he got upset with me, if he was annoyed, he would turn around and say, Shimon, I'm mamish, I was upset, I had a pagam in middle, simply, and I'm so, so sorry I did that, it was, I wronged you. And I took away from you. I said, then I came down. You know, he's up early, four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and his kid's not getting ready for Cheda. And he, come on, move it. And it came from a place of him being exhausted, not Chinuch. And he apologized. And he said, that, that, I, I loved my father for that. I never held anything against him. I never had any grudges because he was so real with me. Growth, change, endless. So we start our slichas. We start our slichot with Ashrei Yoshrei Beisecha Adiel Luchasem. Famously. The Gemara tells us that Ashrei is a tefillah when we say it, there's a place in Olam Haba. Ashrei contains many secrets, many, many secrets. We're not going to go through all the Pesukim, but I would just 
now like to look at the word ashray because the word ashray is very very profound the word itself so we can start with the shimshur for hush start with the shimshur for hush shimshur for hush brings the etymology of the word ashray and this is found in tehillim the first chapter of tehillim ashray ha'ish most people have they translate ashray praiseworthy, fortunate. fortunate, happy. They are all very, very true words. Rav Hirsch brings an underlying etymological expression of this word, which is so profound. He says that ashray is related to the word asho, which is progressing, and asho, which is stepping forward. And this is found in Mishle, the fourth paragraph of Mishle, Yud Dalet, and as well in Kaf Gimel, Yud Tet. The word ashray is related to moving forward, to grow, to develop, to change. The word ashray. So when we say ashray yoishray veisecha, or when we say any words of ashray, ashray ha'ishim tehillim, ashray ashray ha'ish, ashray adam shemefechet tamid, or ashray adam shemefechet trua, all these pesukim, that speak about ashray. Happy is the person. Well, how do you achieve that? How do you achieve this happiness? So Rav Hirsch brings this dimension to the word ashray, that when you are moving forward towards something. So as we've said so many times, people come and they come and they tell you, oh, the tefillah is not engaging enough. Tefillah is not engaging enough. Living a Torah is not engaging enough. Well, have you done anything to try and create an atmosphere to make it more engaging? Um, no. Do you go to Shirim? Uh, no. Do you read? No. Do you listen to any Shirim online? Why you, Rabbi Weinberger, or, or any, you know? No. So what gives you a right to come and say, oh, it's not engaging enough? Ashray, the lotion of Ashray, you want to feel happy? You want Ashray, Yoshray, Beisecha, you want to sit in the house of the Lord? Move forward towards that. Ashray, Adam, Shada, Trua, you want to listen to the, to the Trua? You want to hear the Shaifa? Ashray. Move forward. Do something. Be proactive. Be active. And as we've said before, Yiddishkeit is being activists. We are, and we're meant to be activists. We're meant to be living a, a, an empowered life. We're meant to be thriving. Avram Avinu, he was a person who settled for second best. No, he went out there and he made changes. Avram Avinu was an activist. He was a Meshigadah activist. He went round, he questioned beliefs. He questioned his own belief. Rav Cook writes that people walk around and live a life where they, they have the belief system of the Rabbani Shalom as a five-year-old because they never upgraded. They never downloaded the new program, the new app. Updates. Huh? Updates. Updates. They never updated. Ashrei. You want to be happy? You have to do something to achieve that happiness. You want fulfillment? You have to do something to have that fulfillment. Number one is turning up, but number two is being activist, being an activist, doing something, reading, educating yourself, guidance. As we know, one of the one of the major central themes by Pilsner, by the community, is the Arab sites. Having guidance in life, having guidance, studying the relevant information that's good and healthy and wondrous and wonderful for you, having friends, a community, and financial and physical health. Any issue that occurs in life, usually, as long as a person is healthy, usually it's down to one of those four things. Either it's financial, physical health, either it's community, loneliness, it's, you know, as we've said before, loneliness kills, it's sad, it's painful. Either it's that you don't have the right information for you, your mind isn't engaged, you're not engaged, emotionally you're not engaged, your mind doesn't have something to play around with, we well, don't have proper guidance. Somebody supporting you, loving you, cherishing you, unconditional love. 
Ashrei, you have to work for it. You have to move forward towards it. Most of the time in life, it doesn't find you if you don't take that step forward to find it. It's the most amazing thing in the world. And maybe you've experienced this before. When you take that step forward, magic happens. How many times in your life when you've sincerely taken a step forward? And yes, sometimes there's a very deep struggle. Yeah, But there's so many times that people have experienced. They've taken that step forward, Ashray. And whatever they were looking for found them. It finds them. It finds you. So, Ashrei Ha'ish, Asher the the happy is the person that didn't go in the ways of the Rishayim, but the person who's growing, who's changing, who's developing, they are not found in the path of the Rasha. Ashrei Yoishrei Beisecha, Odi Aluch HaSelam. Praiseworthy are those who dwell in the house of Hashem. The person who's growing is found there. And so many people, they want good, healthy relationships. Well, what did you do towards it? As we know, every relationship consists of you have the Oilam Shana Nefesh, the Chabad Chagat Nehem. What does that look like from Avodah Hashem? So we said that every relationship needs appreciation. You need to have a Karasapon. Every relationship, you have to have a focused amount of time. And every relationship needs what? What's the last one, yeah. Nefesh? You have to have affection in a relationship. You have to have that time, you have to have the affection, and you have to have the Hakarasa Tov, the appreciation. Every relationship needs that. Now, the funny thing is, that doesn't just happen by itself. You have to do something. You have to do something. And so many relationships become stale. Why? Because they haven't thanked for some time. They haven't appreciated. They haven't given attention. They haven't given some sort of time. Or they haven't said a nice word, affection. Every relationship needs this. It doesn't happen by itself. And so many relationships, so many relationships dry out. And it's unbelievable how easy it is to ignite a relationship by partaking in certain conscious activities to give time. Conscious activities to appreciate finding those opportunities, saying to yourself, today I'm going to praise my child five times. I'm going to praise my friend five times. Today I'm going to give my spouse um, a, 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 a little note saying thank you for dinner last night. Hakar Satov, Zman, and Nefesh is the, the love. It doesn't happen by itself. But guess what? It's exactly the same with the Rabbani Shalaylam. Exactly the same with the Rabbani Shalaylam. So many people expect. They have these assumptions. We have to be activists. Moving forward to meet that which we want to occur. I want relationship to Hashem. I have to thank Hashem. I have to appreciate the Rabbani Shalaylam. And say, Rabbani Shalaylam, look what you did for me. Look what you do for me. Look what you've done for me. Always. Rabbani Shalaylam, I love you. Rabbani Shalaylam, I'm going to have a time of learning, a time of tefillah. Every relationship needs these three elements. And obviously, as we've spoken about, we need cover. Cover to give respect. Ashrei is moving forward. If you want to have happiness, if you want to have fulfillment, you have to move, you have to be moving and growing, developing and changing. And that doesn't mean within the happiness you'll have sad days. Uh, part of life, part of the human disposition is, yeah, we will meet some sad days. But the question is, how do we meet those sad days? How do we meet those challenges? Do I meet the challenge that the challenge envelops me and I get lost in the challenge? Or do I meet the challenge and go, wow, I love a pella. Wow, unbelievably amazing. Okay, let's get the gloves on, let's go, let's go to town. Let's get in here, okay. We can't do it by ourselves though, we need community, we need our friends. We need people who think along the same lines of consciousness, who want to reach greater states of fulfillment. It's there for you. Again, 
who is usually and um, really our only worst enemy? Who? Ourselves. Cynicism, skepticism, sarcasm, making assumptions, expectations and assertions. All of those things sometimes can be good in the right place. But for so many people, when it lacks ashray, they are taken over and life becomes painful, bitter, miserable, disconnected. Yes, I just want to reiterate something that you said a number of times, that um, it's not just about ashray, in other words, thanking other people, which are living, breathing things, and God, which we'll call for this analogy a living, breathing thing, but also inanimate objects. How many times have you said, thank the base of Medras, come in and thank the base of Medras? And I think a person who gets used to thanking, you know, when I walk out of my apartment in the morning at six something, I just love the air. I mean, it's nice, cool air, all right? And I am thankful for that air. Um, and I think somebody who gets in the habit of just thanking whatever it is um, could experience, uh, you know, the Asherepa. The main Ashrei. It says, Ashrei Yashrei Basecha, if you want to hear the Trua. And, and what is the Trua? The Rambam says that the Shafer is waking up from our slumber which is das, because consciously I'm awake. I'm awake, I'm not asleep. So it's a level of das, it's a level of coming to a place of being the observer, having the ability to, ah, okay, I'm, I'm present, I'm here, I'm observing. That's what the Swan Rosh Hashanah, the day of das, the day of awareness, self-awareness, the awareness outside of others. Ashrei. Ashrei Yashrei Beisecha. We start Slichus with the word Ashrei. We want to achieve tshuva. Ashrei, go meet us. Also, what's really beautiful is the Imre Yehuda. The Imre Yehuda, he says that Ashrei is the letters of Roshe. Ashrei is as well the letters of beginning. Why? Because we're always, when a person's growing, when a person's transcending themselves, they're always growing, they're always starting again. The, the creation of a Rebbe once said something, and it took me a long time to understand this. He says that a wise person learns Chochmah, and he has this unbelievable insight. And sometimes we have an insight, and that insight is our whole world. The wise person knows, after a short amount of time, let go of it. Don't hold on to it. Because when you hold on to that new insight, it becomes stale, it becomes dry. Let go of it. Let a new insight arise from your kishkit. Let that new insight come down from your neshama. So the ashray, when a person is developing and growing, they leave behind what was, and they move into a new consciousness. They move into a new form of reality. Shuva, you, you have to have ashray. If you expect to have to shuva, you have to have ashray. So he brings the Imre Yehuda of, of Bujan, who is a great grandson of Rokshitz, a great uncle. He says, Ashrei is the gematria of Slicha, Mechil, and Kapara. Take the gematria together, Slicha, Mechil, and Kapara. That Teshuva, Slicha, Mechil, and Kapara is you use your Bechira, you make a choice, and you say, I am not standing for old. I want newness. And sometimes newness, there's fear, there's insecurities there. I'm going to take that step forward. Ashrei, Nisui Kapayim, is related to the word Nisui. The idea of Teshuvah. When we go down on our arm, Teshuvah, when we go down, we're letting go. Marriage, Nisui is moving forward. It's newness, it touches. And as we've said, what, what's the double language of Kedem. Kedem is in the past, to go back to the days of old, but Kedem is as well what? Hitadmut, to move forward. And we're going to end with this. If we, if we want all those wondrous and wonderful things that are always there for us, 
The greatest fulfillment is there for us. The greatest bracha is there for us. The greatest haslacha is there for us. The greatest simchas chayim is there for us. The greatest menuchas nefesh and yeshiva das is there for us. The greatest ava is there for us. Live a conscious life of ashri. And when you live that conscious life, life of ashri, feel that oinek. Yes, there will be struggle, but feel the oinek. Feel the newness. Pump iron. You have the pain of the, you know, the doms, the charlie horse, but your muscles get big, you feel good for it, you build. So, Beis Ras Hashem this week, let it be an avoida for us. Let's take another, one avoida, one avoida, that a day shouldn't go by that we don't tell our spouse that we love them. We, a day shouldn't go by that we don't look at our children and say they're beautiful. Just smile at them. Whatever you can do, be Real, be real, and take that step forward. Beis Rasha Hashem, be chazek. Ashrei. Does anyone have any questions?